in our authority with the Howard County Chamber. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. And so uh, sit tight as we have our participants continue to come through and then we'll get started. Leonardo, are you going to kick us off? You're muted. Yeah, I was just waiting a little bit longer before getting started. Okay. Well, good afternoon again. This is Leonardo McClarty. I'm the president of the Howard County Chamber and want to welcome each of you to our Scale Up series. And, uh, and for those of you that are, are new with us, the chamber has a, a program that we call Gov Connects that is specifically geared towards those in government contracting, both at the state and federal level. Uh, primarily, most of our content deals with federal um, issues, but again, we do delve into state issues as well. And so the Scale Up series is, is new for the chamber this year. And particularly, it's our uh, take on what we deal with issues that would be of interest to those in the government contracting space that are, are truly in growth mode. And so a lot of our content is centered around um, issues and topics that would be of interest to someone that maybe they have uh, primed a few contracts, maybe they're priming a, a lot, or perhaps there's subs that are looking to prime or looking to team and, and enter into other arrangements and agreements with uh, other perhaps uh, like-sized companies, but again, we delve into a lot of topics that aren't necessarily startup related topics because again it's geared towards those uh, businesses that are really trying to grow and to scale and so uh, we've got a, a great panel lined up for us today and so i will introduce our moderator in just a moment who will then also share with you um, some additional insights with regarding how things are going to go today as well as going to detail and introducing our, our panelists. So one, I want to thank Shirley Collier um, for agreeing to, to moderate our, our discussion. And, and Shirley will certainly share some details about her background. She's a highly uh, seasoned uh, business professional and been in this government contracting space for a number of years, having sold companies, ran companies, and now helps in a coaching capacity with, with many uh, startup and, and many seasoned and, and growing government contractors. Also, we have here um, as well David Schaefer and Anna Wright, both from the law firms of Calera Mazza, um, and they'll be sharing a lot of their legal insights, and then Brian Hubbard with Epples Performance Solutions. And again, all of them will have their, um, their background. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention Shirley's company was Scale to Market um, in terms of actually the company name. But before I turn things over to Shirley, I do want to just um, recognize some of the Chamber's uh, annual partners uh, that help us put on our various programs throughout the year, whether in a virtual format like this or when we're face-to-face -face in our more traditional settings. So uh, first, Tower Federal Credit Union, Uninet, um, our lead annual partners, followed by Aronson, and then our supporting partners and Creatrix, Edwards Performance Solutions, HR and New, Phoenix uh, Training Systems, and Prescott HR. 
And so we certainly thank them for, for all of, of their support throughout the course of the year. Uh, certainly we couldn't do what we do without them. And so with that, I am going to get ready to turn things over to Shirley, who will kind of walk us through our program for today and, and introduce our, our panelists. So certainly Shirley, take it from here. Great, thank you Leonardo and welcome everyone. I hope that we find you and your loved ones, your employees and your colleagues to be safe and healthy. Before we get into introductions, I just want to give you a couple of instructions. This is a moderated panel discussion, and as such, we don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but we did develop a white paper that is a synthesis of what we're going to be discussing today. That white paper is available upon request. So Leonardo, if you can send that first poll question out, please. For those of you who are attending and are interested in receiving a copy, please respond to the poll. That gives us permission to email you um, the, uh, the white paper. We will have three poll questions in the course of our discussion, including the one about the white paper. As, we, um, as the poll question comes up, as you can see on your screen, we'll give you a minute to uh, read the question and respond. We also uh, request that you ask us questions as we go forth. We'll be accumulating those questions and then answering them at the end of our discussion. I would now like each one of the panelists to introduce themselves, beginning with uh, Anna, then David, and then Brian. Hi, uh, my name is Anna Wright. I am, as uh, Leonardo noted, an attorney with Polaro Mazza. We are a business law firm. I personally am in our government contracts practice and a lot of my personal practice focuses on the intersection of cybersecurity compliance and federal procurement issues. David? Yeah, great. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much, Leonardo, Shirley, Brian, Anna, for, for um, uh, allowing me to participate and join the, the discussion. So um, as noted, my name is Dave Schaefer. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Polaro Maza. Um, Anna gave a nice little introduction as to who we are and what we do. Generally a full service law firm that caters to businesses with a focus on government contracting in the federal space. My particular practice focuses predominantly in the corporate M&A and transactional space with an emphasis on cybersecurity companies, government contractors, and compliance associated therewith. Um, little fun facts about me, prior to becoming, uh, becoming a lawyer, I was actually a government contractor myself and actually got my start in cybersecurity uh, while in the service uh, in the military. So it is, uh, it is nice, as we, as we will discuss throughout the, the panel today, to have a little bit of background and understand with a, just a bit different perspective can help the operational component of, of what everybody's facing. So again, thank you very much for having me. Great. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Brian Hubbard. Um, I guess I'm the only non-lawyer on the panel. <laughs> so, so, so whatever I say, just, just consider it to be made up and you don't have to, you can't sue me about it. <laughs> um, I'm the director of commercial and cybersecurity at uh, Edwards Performance Solutions. Um, so what we do at Edwards is, is support organizations, not only in their overall cybersecurity programs, but more specifically on how to get prepared for things like CMMC. Um, we're a local firm. Uh, we're in, based in Columbia, uh, but we uh, support the defense industrial base and, uh, and other, other industry verticals across the country. Great, thank you, Brian. Uh, and, and I'm Shirley Collier, as Leonardo said, and the president and founder of Scale to Market. And we help government contractors think, plan, collaborate, and grow in the federal marketplace by developing data-driven, customized business development playbooks. Okay, so uh, first, a little background before we get started with the questions. The aggregate loss of controlled, unclassified information from the defense industrial base increases risk to the national security of our, of our country. To reduce this risk, federal contractors are being required to enhance the protection of CUI or controlled, unclassified information in their networks. The Council of Economic Advisors, an agency within the Executive Office of the President, estimates that malicious cybersecurity activity 
cost the U.S. economy between 57 billion and 109 billion in 2016 alone. The Center for Strategic and International Studies, in partnership with McAfee, reports that as much as $600 billion, or nearly 1% of global GDP, is lost to cybercrime each year. The Department of Defense is very serious about mitigating this significant risk and societal cost. So, Anna, let's begin by understanding the history of cybersecurity awareness at the Department of Defense. Sure. So, because of these issues that Shirley noted, DOD has been placing an increasing emphasis on cybersecurity. And, of course, DOD doesn't want controlled and classified information or any sort of sensitive information to fall into the wrong hands, whether on purpose or by accident. As a result of that, cybersecurity is now the fourth pillar of DOD acquisitions, and some solicitations and contracts now add specific cybersecurity requirements to their evaluation factors, in addition to, of course, the traditional focus on price and technical and past performance, which are the other three pillars of DOD acquisition. Right now, the FAR and DFARs address cybersecurity via two main clauses. There's FAR 52204-21, that's basic cybersecurity safeguards, and there is DFARS 252-204-7012, that's the more advanced cybersecurity requirements, and it broadly includes compliance with all the controls in NIST SP 800-171. Now, critically, both the FAR and DFARS clauses only require self-certification, so that means there's no clear mechanism at this point for verification that these controls are actually being followed without a major, very invasive audit. So, DOD has come up with the CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, which is a third party certification. So, uh, Brian, this is a question for you. What was the problem with the old DFARS? Why was CMMC even necessary? Yeah, thank you, Shirley. So, um... So as Anna mentioned, you know, the current DFARS clause, you know, was it was a good first attempt, right? So about three years ago, when when that clause was altered to include uh, NIST 800-171, um, it was a good first attempt at raising the bar of cybersecurity, which was the goal of, of the overall defense industrial base. Uh, however, you know, it, it, the problem with it from the beginning was it really lacked lacked an enforcement mechanism. Um, it was really left up to this, the contracting officers to determine whether a, a contractor was compliant or what to accept in that contractor. And, and unfortunately, there, there really was no mechanism um, to ensure that the gaps that were identified during what was the self-assessment were actually ever being filled or that that self-assessment itself was actually accurate. Uh, in addition, there, you know, they, they really didn't have a way to ensure that companies' uh, claims of compliance were all true. And uh, there's and just a side note, there's been at least one um, uh, lawsuit uh, from the government uh, against the contractor for a false claim on that uh, because of an incident. Uh, but in addition, you know, the, the really the, there was no mechanism to ensure that the company's claims of compliance were, were true. So basically, the, the DOD didn't get the assurance they were looking for that the defense industrial base could adequately protect the data that it wanted to actually protect, the, C, the uh, controlled and classified information. So enter the CMMC. So the CMMC model you know, builds on the standards that were already there. So the DFARS rule, uh, the current DFARS rule that includes NIST 800 as Anna mentioned, um, and you know, the title of that document is protecting controlled unclassified information in non-federal systems and organizations. So the, the important the reason to point that out is it's, it's in the systems and the organizations. So that's important for a later discussion. Uh, the certification process um, for CMMC will now require companies to be audited by a, a certified third party assessment organization uh, known as a C3PAO. So the acronym, acronym you're gonna start hearing all the time is C3PAO. Um, the certifications, you know, they're gonna follow a set of standards that will ensure that the CMC um, is interpreted the same way across the board. So there'll be a level playing field is the, is the intention of the DOD. Um, 
but that that you know the even though they have the even big playing field you know the the certifications are also going to be centrally managed uh by what's called a, the cmc accreditation body and the dod has given them the central authority basically they're going to be the authoritative source for everything with re regarding cmmc and they're going to be the source that the the dod can go to and say hey I, this contractor is claiming to be certified are they are they compliant um so and, and and i think it was already mentioned but all companies doing business currently with the dod or are planning to do business in, with the dod in the future are going to require to be a minimal a minimum of level one certified which we'll talk about in a few minutes what that means um so the CEOs won't have will will only have the discretion of determining what level of maturity a comp the company the contract is going to require. It will they won't have the discretion to have put out a waiver. So I'll talk about that. Later too. So why is it important that contractors tune in now? Well, so this this is moving pretty rapidly, and you know we'll talk about it probably later um, that you know the. Um, even with COVID, uh, the D DOD and I just was on a what listened to in on a webinar yesterday that had Katie Arrington, the DOD uh, acquisition CISO. Um, she's pushing hard to to keep this thing on on schedule. Um, so you know, way back in uh, January, it seems like a year ago now, but it's <laughs> not that long ago. Uh, the first first. Um, iteration of the CMMC model was released. There's been a, a minor release since then. But what we're going to be expecting to be seeing here in the, in the, in the summer, RFIs are going to be uh, in start to include uh, the certification uh, requirements. And those are going to start rolling out. They, they are predicting June, you know, maybe July at this point. Uh, but that's going to be uh, for these Pathfinder programs. Uh, which are uh, large procurements that are going to you know, be sort of piloting this activity uh, for the DOD. So RFIs are going to start to come out on those. And then the DFARS rule change. So they're going to change the, the actual DFARS uh, rule to, to include CMMC. Uh, that's expected to come out in the fall. Uh, in fact, I just heard yesterday that it should come out for public comment in the next couple of days or next mm -hmm. couple of weeks, I should say. Um, and RFPs are going to start including it, especially in the in the Pathfinder programs first. Uh, those are RFPs are expected in the fall uh, or winter of 2020 and into on into 2021. So it's going to start showing up. Um, so why should you worry about it now if you're not going to be on those Pathfinder programs? You know, if you're currently doing business uh, with a DoD either as a prime or as a sub, you know, you really need to start preparing now. Uh, because if you wait uh, and to see it in an RFP, um, you're going to be you're going to be too late. You, you know, the, you, even if it's a sub, if you even if you're a subcontract, the, the primes are going to expect you to have it now. So, and also, the, and then an important thing uh, that the DoD is emphasizing is that the CMC certification is a go no go decision for starting a contract. So you get an award if you can't prove that you're certified, it's a it's a no go. Execution of the contract. Yeah, that, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and again, the CEOs aren't going to have the option of waiving it. To waiving say, oh, it. well, you know, we'll, we'll we'll get it done later. They're not giving them that option. So, uh, so uh, Leonardo or Taylor, I think that Brian has a graphic. Uh, can you display that? A timeline graphic. Sure, I'll put that up in just a second. Here, I've got it all ready okay. for you. Okay. Yeah, and, it, and it's a simple, simple graphic, but but there's a much more detailed timeline that's out on um, the CMMC site. Uh, CMC AB has a much more detailed timeline, and the DoD has, of course, has a huge timeline uh, for this. You know, yeah. the other thing to consider um, when you're thinking about should I go now or not is that there's over 300,000 companies currently doing business with the Department of Defense right now. All of those companies have to be certified, right? And as we'll talk about, the CMCAB has to stand up the certifiers. So the certifiers are gonna be very, very busy. Yes. You know, so the, the DOD is expecting this to happen over a five year period, but those certifiers are gonna be swamped. 300,000 companies have to get certified. 
So if you don't pass the audit the first time, you may find yourself in, in a situation that you're in a long queue to be reassessed and you may lose out on the contract opportunities. Yep. So you yep. wanna be ready the first time to pass. Uh, yeah. In addition, large primes are gonna start, are already starting. And, and, and again, on that call yesterday, uh, there was a, a several large primes talk, saying that they were already reaching out to their subcontractors uh, to find out where they stand with respect to CMMC. Yeah, so and we're gonna to talk to about that, that in a minute. Happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're gonna start to see that happening a lot. Yep. Um, and you'll need to know where you stand. Um, and it's gonna take time and it's gonna take money to get ready for the certification audit. Um, best, you know, so it's best to plan it in your budgets now so you can do it over, you know, the time period of time as, as opposed to having it all hit you all at once. Yeah, that's good, that's good advice. Um, Leonardo, you can take the graphic down now. Um, so, uh, Dave, can you give us a general overview then of CMMC? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, I mean, I think I think a lot of people in the audience are probably familiar with with CMMC, and I think that what Anna and Brian have have spoken to thus far has provided the appropriate context and background for for what has led us to this point and kind of understanding why we are why DoD is implementing the CMMC. And, and and really in that kind of context, it makes a lot more sense. Is that CMMC is really a supply chain risk management mechanism that is, you know essentially a progressive and escalating series of requirements. And, and we'll talk later about the difference between the, the domains and the practices and the processes and, and all of those different types of words and, and, and the mechanism in which they evaluate you on that. But it's really a risk management system that's designed to minimize and mitigate the risks associated with cybersecurity in the DOD supply chain. And that is from the prime contractors to the subcontractors to even the lower tier subcontractors. This is intended to go all the way from the top throughout the entire supply chain to be a, a, a lot broader. And that's why, you know, as Brian just mentioned, when we're talking about the, the sheer volume of people who are gonna be looking to get this type of certification, you know, it's gonna be a larger number. It's gonna be, you know, uh, an initial, you know, uh, tidal wave of, of applicants when the, when the uh, certifiers are finally announced and the marketplace is set up. So it is that kind of progressive, um, certification. It goes essentially from level one to level five. I know Anna's going to talk more specifically about that, but suffice it to say that level one is just going to be your basic general cybersecurity hygiene. Level five is going to be the advanced. And that every company, everybody within the supply chain is going to have to have some level of certification, whether it be just a level one, which is again pretty basic, or a level five, which is going to be the much more advanced. And that's really reserved for just a, a, a select few contractors. So, but everyone within the defense industrial base is going to have this. And the intent, again, is to preserve the supply chain in order to, surely, as you pointed out at the outset, mitigate some of those financial losses, maximize the national security, and really remedy the discrepancies and issues that were present in the DFARS clause and remove the self verification, remove the POEM, and really get down to actually making this, um, this work and, and have a, a system to verify it. So, it will be just another component, another certification. It's not gonna go away. And if anything, it's gonna be, continue to be more prevalent in the acquisition space. Uh, so Dave, how do you know what level of CMMC is required for a given procurement? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I mean, of course, the, the RFI, the RFP, and, and whatever the prime contractor says is obviously going to, to dictate predominantly what it is that you're gonna be aiming for but also really talking about what type of information that you have and understanding the difference mostly between say a level one and a level three. You know, if it's a level three, and, and again, Anna's gonna to speak to the nuances more specifically of what that entails, but a level three is really intended just to be the NIST 800-171 that, that the DFARS had incorporated with regards to the protection of CUI. And so really most people should almost be there. But if you're, a prime or a sub that's going to have CUI on your network, if you're going to be interacting with CUI, and, and Shirley, you mentioned kind of what that is, but essentially, you know, associated with PII, government financial records, things that are coming out of that contract and potentially marked or unmarked um, by the contracting officer, you know, you're going to want to have to protect that. And that's going to require a level three. So if you think, you know, in anticipation before the RFIs, RFPs come out, if you think that what you do is going to touch that information, 
and you can start thinking about kind of the level three certifications and requirements. You know, and additionally, federal contract information, um, information that you generate is also part of the CMMC governance. So to the extent that your activities generate information, you're also likely to have a higher level requirement. Again, probably up to the level three, because again, the four and five is, is reserved for a little bit more advanced uh, uh, acquisitions and, and contracts. Um, so, um, Anna, uh, Dave mentioned about levels and domains. Can you give us a little bit more detail on what we're talking about there? Sure. So, I'll just walk through the, the levels really quick for you all. Um, level one is basic cyber hygiene, just performed across your company. Things like installing antivirus software, requiring usernames and passwords for logging on to your company systems, escorting visitors, uh, having locks on your doors, just basic best practices for making sure that information doesn't leak. Level one tracks to the requirements in FAR 52-204-21, and these requirements are already present in many federal contracts, so a lot of folks are probably going to have familiarity with these already. Now note that level one is only appropriate if you have FCI in your system, not CUI. So if you have any kind of CUI in your system, you're not, level one's not gonna cut it for you. You're gonna need to go to level three, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Level two is a transition step from one to three. It's intermediate cyber hygiene documented. So it would include practices like weekly system backups, having a system security plan, uh, locking user accounts after a certain number of unsuccessful logins, that, that sort of thing, just to step up from the basic requirements in level one. Now level two is still only appropriate if you handle FCI but not CUI, which is why we often call it a, more of a transitional step. And now level three, this is what tracks to NIST 800-171 and DFARS 204, or 252-204-7012. Uh, this is good cyber hygiene and it's managed across your company. This is going to be practices like FIPS validated encryption modules, uh, separation of duties to uh, preclude cybersecurity related conflicts of interest. So for example, uh, the employee responsible for creating a particular cybersecurity protocol is not going to be the same employee who is responsible for testing that protocol. Um, and also just keeping abreast in general of cyber threat intelligence. Um, and as I noted, of course, this tracks to DFARS 252-204-7012 and NIST SP 800-171. So that means these requirements, analogous to level three, are already present in many DOD prime contracts and many subcontracts as well, just by virtue of the flow down process. Uh, level three is the lowest level you will be able to have if you handle CUI. And just to clarify for folks, FCI, that's federal contract information, that is anything that the government gives to you or that you make in performance of a government contract that is not supposed to be public. It's a big bucket, and that's what levels one and two are intended to cover. Level three, as Dave noted previously, or sorry, CUI, as Dave noted previously, um, that's controlled and classified information that's often marked. Uh, there's a CUI registry you can go to to see if something is CUI. Um, now, finally, levels four and five, I'm not going to get into that very much. That's very proactive cyber hygiene, very advanced, optimized. It's not applicable to most DOD contractors, um, and Brian's going to explain that some more. Uh, but before we get into that with Brian, um, Dave, can you uh, tell us about some of the common terms that contractors need to become familiar with? Sure, and, and these, are the, these are the big terms with regards to how you're gonna be evaluated and how this kind of progressive scale is, is measured and, and how implemented. And, and that's really, so first is there's domains. There's the broad categories of cybersecurity controls that are gonna be evaluated. There's 17 cybersecurity domains within the CMMC. Um, after that, there are capabilities, which are subcategories of those domains that are really technical abilities. Then practices, which are even more specific, you know, enumerated types of practices that are implemented in order to satisfy you know, certain criteria and check the box and really demonstrate your capacity to perform in each of those domains. 
And then finally, there's, there's processes. And processes is a pretty interesting component because what it is is really how the demonstration of how those practices, capabilities are ingrained into an organization. And, and this requires, again, this is, do you actually have it in your handbook? Do you actually have the policies? Do you do your quarterly um, audits and, and you know a demonstration of the historical pattern in which you have satisfied it? So in this way, and really it ties into what Brian said earlier, in this way, it's not just enough to have the practice, you've got the, you've got the policy, you've got it in hand. You actually have to be able to demonstrate that you, it's ingrained into the organization. It's part of the organization. And so that obviously takes time, which again, just leads to another point um, that Brian was making with regards to, it's better to start really considering this sooner rather than later. But again, domains, capabilities, practices, processes, these are kind of the core tenets of CMMC and, and things that everyone ultimately is going to be tremendously familiar with. And as everyone has mentioned, it's the validation of mm -hmm. the implementation of those processes that is the key difference. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so uh, Brian, Anna mentioned about the levels. Um, what is the contractor community expecting in terms of the minimum requirements? So yeah, so so um, you know, it, it's depending on which which piece of your skeptical hat you put on. But the, <laughs> the you know the DoD has made it made it you know, very, very clear that the minimum is gonna be a, a certified as a level one, right? So that's basic security hygiene. Um, but, and, and just as a side note, you know, that doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, you, there's a lot of work to be done there. And, and, and it's not, um, if you hear some of the DOD folks talk, they'll say, oh, cyber hygiene, everybody's doing that. I can guarantee you, I've been around this a lot, they're not doing it. You're not doing it. <laughs> so you need to, you need to look at it and make sure you are. So, and then again, as Anna said, and, and David reiterated that CUI is being processed if that control and classified information is there, the year level three is going to be required. And, um, you know, it should be noted, you know, that a lot of DOD agencies aren't currently marking things well. And with CUI, there's some new regulations coming out. But if you're a, if you're a uh, NSA contractor, for example, because we're in Howard County, we're probably, a lot of us are doing that. Things are gonna come out as for official use only. That is CUI, okay? You think, about, think about that. You know, if you have you know, FOUO stuff coming into your inbox, you got a level three requirement. So, um, you know, so again, back to my, back to the point, you know, Industry is looking at this and, you know, I've sat in on a couple of things, the Pro Professional Services Council and things and heard other companies uh, kind of uh, um, talk about this, but, you know, based on past history and, and I've been in and around this stuff for 35 years, so I've seen, seen, seen it happen every single time. There's something we call requirements creep. Um, that will happen and industry is expecting that to occur and so we're really, you know, um, Expecting that because the CO, CEOs and the prime contractors are going to want flexibility in, to know exactly, you know, they may not know ahead of time what exactly, what kind of CUI they're going to put out to the contractors. Um, so, you know, it could show up at any time. They're going to want that flexibility. So the industry fears that the de facto standard, the de facto minimum is going to become a level three. Um, and that's what we're hearing, hearing from a lot of industries' perspectives. So explain a little bit more about levels four and five and under which, which circumstances that level will be required. Okay, sure. I, I won't go into a lot of depth on this, but, but level four and five are, are really reserved for those very critical systems. I think um, you know, the, the uh, DOD acquisition CISO, Katie Arrington, she's, she's talking about that as being less than 1%. I mean, it's a very, very small percentage of the contracts that are going to require this. It's really reserved for those critical high high end systems. So those you know critical weapon systems, things that you know if they were stolen could do real damage uh, while they're still unclassified could still do uh, severe damage to uh, the defense posture of the United States. Uh, so you know they they expect that you know again that it's going to be used on a very very uh, minimal set of uh, contracts. 
Okay. Um, Anna, this is a question for you. How will the new CMMC DFARS clause be issued and added to contracts? So the CMMC DFARS clause is going to be issued and added in the same way that any other DFARS clause would be issued and added. So that means that it's going to need to go through the rulemaking process before it can be added to any contracts. Now, the CMMC administrators have stated that a rule is in the works, but it's still in the early stages, so we don't specifically know when it's going to be implemented or how it will be implemented. So we don't, we don't have the text of the clause yet. Presently, there are no plans to add new CMMC requirements to existing awarded contracts, but CMMC can be added to recompetes of those contracts. It's meant to be added to new opportunities. So if you know that a recompete of your contract is coming up, you might want to check and see if you think CMMC requirements might be included in that recompete. Good. You can probably expect that it will be. Yeah, if I could just add Especially that, if you're in one of the Pathfinder programs. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So if, if, I, if I could just add to that, Shirley, it, the um, you know, existing, if, you have your, if your existing contracts have the current DFARS clause, you are expected, you know, it's expected to be enforced and you're expected to, to comply with that. So, um, you know, the DOD is planning to have this phase in over a five year cycle to get 100% of the DOD contractors. But if you currently have that clause, you need to be um, aware of it and need to get your systems up, up to stuff. Okay, excellent. Uh, Taylor or Leonardo, if you can get the next poll question posted, uh, please. Um, and then we'll give the audience uh, just a minute to look at this question and respond. Uh, this question is regarding uh, the DFARS Clause 252-204-7012 in your existing contracts uh, and RFPs. Okay, so while the uh, audience is responding to that, um, Anna, where in DOD RFPs will CMMC be referenced? So CMMC will be referenced in sections L and M of those RFPs. Okay, excellent. And uh, Leonardo or Taylor, if you can uh, tell us if we have poll results. Yes, it looks like the, um, the results are still coming in. We're a little over halfway. Okay. Um, and um, so, um, Anna, why don't we take another question from you while those uh, answers are still coming in. Um, so how do contractors actually obtain CMMC? So as Brian mentioned earlier, the CMMC accreditation body or as they're often referred to, the CMMC AB, is ultimately going to oversee CMMC certification. It has been formed already, it was formed back in January, and it's currently in process of building the structure necessary to train these C3 PAOs that Brian also mentioned earlier. CMMC AB also plans to open a virtual marketplace, so companies who need CMMC certification can go to that marketplace and view the actual certified C3 PAOs. Um, of course, this marketplace isn't up yet because there aren't any C3 PAOs yet. So stay tuned for that. Um, at this point, uh, DOD has stated that CMMC certification will be good for three years. So you'll only need to be recertified in theory once every three years. Yeah, that's a that's a good thing. Um, Anna, I want to clarify that the uh, C3PAOs are the people who are the certifiers, right? Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay. So the folks that you would go so to, if you're seeking CMMC certification, that's the company you would go to to obtain that certification. Okay, excellent. Uh, so Taylor, do we have the results of the poll? Yes, I've hit share, let me know. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, look, it, it looks like about a third of people don't have DOD contracts, uh, which is okay. And probably the reason that you're attending this is because, probably because you would like to have DOD contracts. So um, good. And then uh, I think everyone can see 
the, the results of the poll. So thank you very much for responding to, to that. Um, so uh, Anna, you mentioned about the uh, three uh, the C3PAOs, and you have a web address? Yes, so the CMMC accreditation body's web address is cmmcab.org. So Charlie, Mama, Mama, Charlie, Alpha, Bravo, dot org. Now, as I noted, the virtual marketplace isn't online yet, but you can sign up for updates on the CMMC AB website. If you just scroll to the bottom of their homepage, they have a little form you can fill out that will sign you up for email updates. And I want to mention to all the attendees that all of the web addresses that we reference in our discussion are embedded in the white paper with hot links directly to those sites. And, uh, and that white paper is free upon request. Okay, now let's talk about cost of compliance, which is something that all small businesses, of course, uh, worry about. Although no one knows for sure, I've been telling my clients that it's going to be in the thousands of dollars, not hundreds of dollars. Anna, what are you hearing? Yes, that's, that's what I've been hearing from DOD as well. Uh, DOD in particular has projected that the cost of a level one certification, that's the baseline certification, will be roughly $3,000. Now, that's just the certification. That's not the upkeep cost associated with keeping your systems in compliance with that certification. Certification costs will be allowable, so that $3,000 price tag will be allowable. And DOD has also stated that contractors should build the certification costs into their proposals. And that's an excellent point. Um, so there's really no reason for small businesses to not become certified because it is a reimbursable expense. Right, Anna, am I right about that? Yes, yep, okay. that is correct, yes. Okay. Great. So um, just to add to that, you know, you, some the DOD likes to talk about, you know, trying to keep it under, you know, the reasonably cost uh, of the certification. But that's not your only cost. So, you know, some might assume that you pay for an audit and, and that you're done with your costs. Yeah. That's not the case. So it's it, um, the reality of it is that the cost, there are several cost areas, right? So there's the cost of understanding your gaps. So, you know, really understanding what, what do you need to do, uh, whether you hire somebody to come in to help you with that or do it yourself, you gotta have some costs associated with that. There's the cost of filling those gaps. So there's the cost of the audit itself, that C3PAO coming in, actually doing a, a full-blown audit. Uh, if anybody's ever gone through a CMMI audit or a ISO kind of audit, you, you know what, what I'm talking about there. Um, there is likely to also be a fee that you have to pay to the CMCAB. That's going to be sort of like a, a, a to maintain your cert kind of thing. If you if any of you have certifications in a from I don't know, Project Management Institute, from IIC squared, or any, any of those kind of organizations, you know that every year you pay something right to maintain your certification. They haven't defined that yet, but there's likely to be some costs there. Um, and, and you have to budget, like as Anna said, you have to budget for running and maintaining your program. So you can't just say, I'm going to get this and I'm going to get the certification and then forget about cybersecurity for the rest of the rest of the three year period. It didn't happen that way. And then every three years you have to be recertified. Um, and there's possibly going to be annual audits. And in what was mentioned yesterday, there might be, um, uh, some surveillance going on uh, from the DOD side from an external mm -hmm. perspective that they're going to be monitoring uh, certified companies to ensure that they haven't been compromised uh, mm -hmm. and, and make sure that they're from an external perspective they're still still uh, uh, compliant so they're they're working on that and also you know I just want to emphasize that the certification process isn't fully baked yet okay the CMC AB is a voluntary body, uh, so so all those people on that board are volunteers. And right now, they're really working. Um, you know, I give them all the credit in the world. They're working hard uh, to try to come up with the standards and all the certification process. How do they even certify certifiers? Uh, they're they're still defining all that. And we're expecting to start seeing that 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 rollout, training rollout, and things in the in the uh, in the coming months, uh, hopefully, uh, some you know, in the June time frame, we probably will start seeing some things come out. And want to emphasize: no company is certified, so 
and no company is capable of certifying you at this time. So if anybody's telling you that, they're flat out lying to you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that clarification, Brian, yeah. because there are always opportunists <laughs> that try to take advantage of, of this uncertainty. Yeah, so, we've, um, we've, just, we've already seen one advertise out at a level that said their product was level five certified. Well, wow. Even, they, that got the, the ire of the DOD CISO. They came yeah. down and right on LinkedIn, posted right on that person's post, you are not certified. Ooh. There's no way of doing that. So. Wow. Okay. Uh, so, David, what can companies do to prepare? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a there's a variety of things that companies should consider. Um, first and foremost is, as Brian said, the process isn't fully baked yet, so there is going to be obviously the need to maintain some flexibility with regards to the precise nature of compliance. But a lot of the things that a company can do right now is start allocating resources, start incorporating this into your short-term and long-term budgets because it will cost money, not just for the certification, but for continued compliance. Um, it's really gonna become, really has to be ingrained into your organizational culture and your behavior and of course in, in, your, in your balance sheet and, and some of your expenses. So start really thinking through that and what costs are gonna be associated with that. Start lining up your vendors, start having those conversations to see who might be a good fit for you. Brian talked about the gap analysis. One of the things that we recommend as well is really digging through your contracts and determining what are the exact requirements that you do have. You know, you said that you're, you know, say NIST compliant, but are you really NIST compliant? Really starting to, to go through your internal documents, see what you should be complying with, really look at yourself and understand if you are compliant. And then, you know, outside of the CMMC context, make sure that you're just third party vendors and your regular cybersecurity is also kind of taken care of to understand that that it, it really all comes into one and the same thing. And again, as mentioned before, because CMMC requires an evaluation of processes and really the implementation of those practices, start putting them in place now, even though we may not have the precise nuances, but you need to start showing and being able to document evidence that you've at least attempted in good faith to follow all of the information that you have right now. That's gonna go a long way because as Brian said at the very outset, with 300,000 people looking for certification, if you fail the first time, you're gonna to go to the back of the line and that's certainly not a place that you're gonna to wanna to be in. So really we're talking about the preparatory phase, budget, what legal requirements, what cybersecurity requirements, whether that be technical policies or what, what have you, start at least at a minimum identification of what those are so that you can make a plan of how to address those. And I want to 100% agree with what Dave's saying. It's very important to understand what, what you, not only what your contracts are saying, but where your information is. And I always, always recommend to my clients to start, start with a gap assessment, really understand you know, where you stand with respect to the requirements. And, and get an understanding of what, it's going to, what you're going to need to do to get ready for an audit. Um, you, know, you need to budget for the projects that it's going to take to fill those gaps and get started on that remediation. Um, you, know, you really need to start operating now as if you already had the requirements in your contract. Likely, auditors are going to expect to see, as they, as they do with other programs like ISO and, and um, CMMI, the auditors are going to expect to see some running running evidence, right? They're gonna to expect to see evidence that your programs are up and running, that you're effective, effectively uh, implementing all the controls within your organization. Um, you know, some, some companies may not be able to do this internally with their staff. Um, they may not have the staff or the cycles, or if they do have the, you know, they may not, the staff themselves may not have the cycles to get it done. Um, in that case, uh, you know, hire a, a CMMC consultant um, to help you get ready. Uh, start getting ready now. Um, you know, and, and for smaller companies that, you know, some companies may not know where to start. Um, for that, you know, for example, Edwards, we, we designed a, a CMMC quick look assessment to help companies that really get started in the right direction and without having to spend a lot of money. So we have, we have a, this quick look uh, will provide you an understanding of your gaps, the project you should undertake, some of the consulting time, and then, you know, provide some consulting time uh, to help you get through it. Um, the great part, uh, you know, in, especially in, in the uh, 
COVID era here, um, is that all of this work uh, from the quick look perspective, it's, it can be done remotely. And now might be a good time to start, start thinking about it because there are more cycles uh, with people not having to commute <laughs> right now. Yep. So. Yeah, so you might be able to get that get through that process a lot more efficiently right now than if you wait six months. Right. Um, Dave, what are the specific steps that companies can take to obtain level one certification? Sure. I mean, I think as Anna had mentioned previously, you know, level one is just our basic cyber hygiene and talking about, you know, some of the antivirus and some of those types of things. I mean, obviously, as, as, as Brian and I just alluded to, understanding exactly what there's 17 practices and controls that you need to adhere to, taking a look at what those 17 things are and, and methodically kind of checking the box and making sure that you do those. But one of the things that comes up with that is, making sure your policies and procedures, your handbooks, and all of your kind of supporting documentation is in place. So at the outset, again, just taking those 17 criteria and, you know, starting to go through um, the list, if you will. And Anna, do you want to elaborate on that? Sure, yeah. So there are also other uh, sources that you can take advantage of right now. Potentially, you can obtain assistance from your prime contractors, if you're a subcontractor, through uh, the SBA and DOD mentor-protege programs. Um, and if you're DOD, in particular, uh, costs associated with uh, certain mentorship um, processes are allowable for prime contractors, so that's something you could look into. Um, you can also take advantage of free resources. DOD is slated to provide free training regarding CMMC in particular, not for certification purposes, mind you, but for just general informational purposes so you can really start to understand more of where DOD is looking to head with all of this. And do you have web addresses that we can share with the audience? I do. They are in the white paper. They're they're pretty long, <laughs> they so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna <laughs> say them on air because that's gonna take up the rest of our time. Uh, but so Defense Acquisition University is DoD's uh, source for this uh, potential free training, or well, not potential, actual free training at this point. Um, DAU's landing page for CMMC issues contains sign-up links to three free webinars that are going to take place in May, June, and July. Um, and of course, for updates from CMMCAB directly, you can sign up for the news and email updates directly on their website. Yes, excellent. And again, all those websites with links are embedded in the white paper. Uh, Brian, did you have anything uh, to add? Oh, you're you're. You're muted. <laughs> My apologies. Somebody's on the bingo. Um, so I, again, you know, please remember that the auditors and the and and the uh, aka the C three C three PAOs are going to be scarce resources for some time because as the the whole program gets started and ramped up, um, there's going to be a lot of demand and there's going to be a lot of demand on getting getting companies into the C three PAO program. There could be a lot of demand on people wanting to get certified. So it'll be really important that you pass the first time. So yep. getting that kind of training, taking advantage of those resources, uh, getting, getting yourself ready to avoid those delays that could cost your business ultimately. Excellent. Um, Anna, let's address some of the practical business development issues related to CMMC. Do contractors have to meet CMMC requirements at the time of proposal submission or at the time of award? Right now, DOD is saying that contractors will have to meet those requirements at the time of contract award, not proposal submission. Okay, excellent. And um, Dave, this is for you. Does CMMC apply to contractors' products as well as their networks? Yeah, currently it doesn't. I mean, CMMC is really focused on the organization's practices and, and policies and processes. Um, as, as a whole and not necessarily any product really it's about the organization and not any sort of tangible product. Okay and Brian will civilian agencies be adopting CMMC? So so yeah I think you know the contracting community is, is bracing for that 
uh, there were um, the existing DFARS clause uh, is probably going to be a, a adopted into the FAR. I think that was mentioned earlier, but uh, you know that may happen over the next couple of years. But um, we're expecting that CMMC proves if, prove, if it proves itself out in the DoD, then it's going to be adopted by the rest of the federal government, and um, and likely we'll start to see it in some of the state state requirements as well mm -hmm. um, across the country. Um, because that, that seems to be the sort of the, the way, the theme, the, the, the cadence of what happens. And um, far changes will probably be within the next two years or, or sooner. Another thing I heard yesterday, um, there was some talk about Sarbanes-Oxley actually being changed um, mm -hmm. to include cybersecurity. Um, I don't know whether this is a, 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 a visionary statement or not, or whether it's really being talked about. Um, but if Sarbanes-Oxley, if they have to adopt the CMMC um, kind of constructs in order to report up through the cybersecurity pieces of Sarbanes-Oxley, that would that would include all business, so not just uh, not just DoD contracts. Yeah. So uh, the the moral to the story here is that you're not going to get away with not having secure systems if you want to do business in the United States. Yeah, I mean it's it's a national problem, and and you know the everybody recognizes it as a as a national problem. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, Taylor, if you can please post the next poll question. Uh, this next question is about. Um, the status with respect to compliance of either NIST 800-171 or CMMC. So if you'll take a moment to read and respond to that question, please. While the audience is answering that, Brian, um, what will be the responsibility of primes to ensure that their subs are certified? Well, that's that's a that's a great point, and and and, and the current DFARS clause and the and the future one will be a flow down requirement. Uh, so all subcontractors on a contract will have to comply. Um, now it is is possible that the prime, if a prime contractor has has a requirement in the contract for for level three compliance, a subcontractor may only need to be level one, you know, as David mentioned earlier. But it's the responsibility of the prime to really identify that, negotiate that with the CO. And um, in theory, um, it's possible that the procurement could actually predefine what pieces of the contract uh, would be at what level. However, again, based on that 35 year history of me seeing this, um, that's very difficult for the government to do. And, and because you know, it's not likely that they're, for a solution, they're not likely to be specifying all of the components of the solution. So they may not know ahead of time what uh, what's where the CUI is going to re 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 be required, and so it'll be up to the prime to propose uh, what makes sense for the contract. Okay, that that um, that makes sense. So Taylor, do we have the results of this poll yet? Oh no. Okay, so it looks like uh, sixty-eight percent has said that their primes have not ask them yet about being compliant. Of course, you can't become certified yet, um, but uh, at least a, a third of them are beginning that conversation. Um, Brian, uh, so do you expect uh, this to change that you'll see more prime contractors expecting subs to be certified? Yeah, definitely. In fact, uh, again, you know, that, that call yesterday was pretty enlightening. They had had five five uh, CISOs from large primes on the call, and um, all of them said they're reaching out to their subcontractors. And I want to reiterate a point that Anna made earlier, and that is it can be for a small business, it can be a competitive advantage. If you go ahead and get certified, it makes you could potentially make you more attractive to a prime contractor. Okay, Brian, another question for you. Many businesses operate in the cloud. How do they ensure those applications and data are CMMC compliant? Yeah, so, so it's very important that uh, people work with their cloud providers or, you know, you know it could be because it is still the responsibility of the business to ensure that whatever systems they use or whoever is managing those systems for them are complying uh, at the level that, that they themselves have to comply. Um, so 
you know, it's important that you, you work with your managed service providers, you work with your cloud providers to make sure that they're actually compliant as well. Um, I think we've all probably read recent stories in the, in the press about managed service providers being compromised and their customers' data being stolen. Um, that's still the responsibility of the business. You know, it's, it, the customers are looking at, at the business, not at the managed service provider. Yes. Uh, any final comments from the panelists before we open up the Q&A? Okay, let's go to a couple of the questions uh, here. One question is, um, is there any indication of which country or countries are stealing our CUI? Brian, yes. do you have <laughs> all, <laughs> all um, of the above? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, certainly, I mean, it, probably everybody read, well, you know, China. I mean, one of the, one of the, the big examples is, is a major, major fighting uh, uh, air, airplane system, um, uh, you know, fire jet that was showed up in a, in a Chinese uh, air show before the U.S. even had a prototype. Oops. Um, and it was all based on our plans. So, so, so China, anybody, you know, anybody, Russia, you know, they're all, everybody is, all the nation states are interested in it. Yeah, no, no, no surprise there. Okay, next question. I am an assistant project manager, construction and renovation, who once held a TS SEI clearance from 2010 to 2015. And I'm wondering if this makes sense for me. How difficult is it to obtain? And how does one go about doing it? I'll say first, it, it's, this is not a personal, this is not an individual certification. This is an organizational certification. Um, so it, it's it's up to the organization and how the, how the organization does it. It can be as, as easy or as hard <laughs> as as how how well structured their cybersecurity program is. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, um, let's see. Is Microsoft GCC high required for CMMC level three? No. Okay. Remember, just something to clarify here. CMMC is its own independent certification. It's not going to be contingent upon uh, whether you're ISO certified or whatever FedRAMP uh, Microsoft, whatever other certification you might have. It's not contingent upon that. It's its own thing. So there aren't going to be specific requirements with respect to other certifications or particular softwares or implementations. It's its its own process. Will CMMC compliance be delayed due to COVID-19? Go ahead and say, so all indications, um, you know, it's, it's full steam ahead. Um, so, as as early as yesterday, again, Kate, Katie Arrington was on that call, um, saying that while it might cause some minor delays, they're not. It's not going to be a one for one. They're, they're still still planning on the same timeline that we talked about earlier. They're still planning on that timeline. Okay, and, and this uh, next question may have already been answered, Anna, but maybe you want to elaborate on it. Uh, will I be able to use my ISO certification to fulfill CMMC requirements? Uh, presently, no, but uh, the CMMC accreditation body is looking into potentially providing uh, reciprocity with other certifications that were relied on to create the CMMC. Now, they, of course, this is all, of course, still in the formative stages, so we don't know to what extent that reciprocity would be provided, but don't rely on that possibility right now. Yeah, just okay. to add to that, I mean, if, if your ISO, if your company is ISO 27001 certified, uh, you have gone a long way towards the level three requirements already. So it shouldn't be that big of a leap for you to, to get ready for a, a CMMC uh, audit. Okay. Next question is, what is the expected average time to prepare for certifying for CMMC, say level three? So, how deep are your pockets? <laughs> the answer to that. So, you know, money you have. <laughs> you know, what the what, the one thing that that's important. It, it really depends on where you are today and and how, what your gaps are and and where and where you need to be and when you need to be there. 
Um, what's important in a, in a in overall cybersecurity program is you don't want to break the bank, right? I mean, it's not, you don't want to go out of business trying to get compliant. So what you need to do is, is, is do things that are reasonable for your business on the timeline that your business can, can absorb it, but also with that window, knowing that that window is closing to get ready. So there are ways of, of complying with every one of these requirements that are in, in, in these, these, these uh, um, specifications without having to break the bank. You know, there, there's ways of doing this that, are, that is reasonable, that is affordable for your company at the pace that your company can absorb it. But, but generally, Brian, are you thinking three to six months? Again, it, it, I mean, really, it, it wildly depends. I mean, I, I've had clients I work with that it, 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 we, we laid out a three-year plan. Oh, wow. Um, you know, I'm getting up to speed with 8171. Okay. So it, it really depends on, on, you know, and other clients, you know, it's, it's much more compressed. Yeah. It, it really just depends on where they are and what they need to do across yeah. their entire enterprise. Yeah, okay. Um, the next question is, um, the DOD has suggested the cost of complying uh, will be an allowable expense within the contract awarded. Can you speak to what contractors should do to account for these costs and how will they seek reimbursement for them once a contract is awarded? Who, who wants to, to? I'm going to leave that one to David and Ann. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't have any so, CPAs on the call. <laughs> so the, the honest answer here is we don't know yet. DOD hasn't provided guidance for how that's going to be reimbursed. Um, we don't know if they're going to add like another cost principle or something like that, but frankly, at this point, we don't, we don't know. Um, a good idea would be to make sure that your costs for CMMC are segregable. Um, but it's also not totally clear as to whether DOD is going to consider just the certification cost. So like the $3,000 that we mentioned previously for level one certification, if that's going to be the only allowable cost or if somehow the uh, preparation costs are also going to be folded into that. It's just that we haven't received yeah, I assume back. that there's a, there are a lot of lobbyists <laughs> that are lobbying for a broad definition of expenses that can be reimbursable uh, yeah. under these under these contracts. But but you're right, Anna, we don't we don't really just know to, yet. Just add one thing to that, Shirley. I, I just it's occurred to me that it, there there are two two programs for, for the companies that are probably on this call, which are all Maryland based companies, right? There are two programs that you can take advantage of, um, at least two that I know of. There's the Maryland, Maryland uh, MEP, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership, has a program to, um, to actually help you get, get reimbursement for work towards NIST 800 which is, of course, CMMC level three, essentially, yeah. uh, with a few exceptions. Um, and then there's another program for smaller companies. There's a, a, a tax credit a Maryland tax credit uh, for companies that are, I think it's the limits are under, under 50, 50 uh, employees and, and use a Maryland company to, to help you. Um, if you're interested in those programs and, and help me get us help you reach, reach out to me after this and, uh, and I can get you pointed in the right direction. Good. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, and for all of the attendees, our email addresses are going to display here in, in a minute as we wrap up. So uh, please feel free to reach out uh, to any of us on any of these specific questions. Next question is, for primes, how many levels down in the supply chain will they need to inspect? These are good questions. <laughs> yeah, you know, the way the way the language is coming out right now, I, anybody that's anybody that's uh, that's participating in that contract and has contract language that's associated with the DoD is going to need to that has to be passed down all the way down, so all all the way down okay. the, the chain. So if all you're tiers. a third tier, fourth tier yes. sub, you're going to yeah, have that, you're going to have the requirement. Yeah, that that would be my guess as mm -hmm. as well for that. Um, and uh, yeah, so Taylor, I think you have a couple more questions. Uh, let's see, I was able to find the domains in the 800-171, but they are missing three. Where can I find the other three domains? David, is that something so, you're... Yeah, I mean, this is, no, go ahead, David. Well, I was going to say, I mean, as I'm sure, I mean, in, in you know, while the, the NIST 800-171 provides a lot of the context for 
how the CMMC was built. You can look at the actual CMMC on the DOD's acquisition website to have the actual plan. And they've got a nice PowerPoint as well that gives a good summary right. that's going to list out the 17 capability domains for you. So um, go straight to the source for those types of things on the CMMC. Um, the NIST is just one component of CMMC, um, but go straight to the CMMC and, and that'll, that'll fill in the gaps there. Okay, good, good um, answer there, David. Thank you. My company would like to be part of the test case. What direction can you provide? Who can I talk to? For that, you're going to have to go directly to the CMMC AV. Um, I don't, we don't know how specifically they're going to roll that piece out. But if you want to be involved, I know they do have some working groups that they've been uh, talking to. Uh, so you can you can sign up for those on the CMMCAB website. There's also a program out there called um, Project Spectrum. It's pro if you, so if you go on Google ProjectSpectrum.io, um, you can get some information there. There's a um, that's being run by the uh, uh, Maryland. Uh, I'm going to get Missy the acronym for Missy wrong, um, so I'll just say Missy. Um, part of the Dreamport, uh, you know the Missy runs Streamport. They're running this program, uh, Project I, Project Spectrum .io, uh, which is may may give some companies a, a head start as well. Okay, excellent. And the final question, um, I'll take this one. It is: uh, Are there local resources we can call upon to help? And yes, they're on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> the three panelists here are experts in this area, and pl please do reach out uh, to them. So Taylor, if you can put the last slide up that has our contact information, uh, that would be great. And I would like to thank all of you for attending today. We hope that you found this discussion to be informative. Um, if you have not responded to the poll regarding our white paper, please do email us and uh, let us know that you are interested in, in the white paper and we'll be glad to, to send that to you. Thank you to our panelists, Anna, David, and Brian for sharing your expertise today. And I also wish to thank Leonardo McClarty, Executive Director of the Chamber and his staff, Taylor Tarleton, who is uh, helping behind the scenes with everything. And uh, thank you for hosting and coordinating all of this. It's been fun. So Taylor, you want to have some closing comments regarding upcoming events? Sure. Thanks so much, Shirley. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I'm still learning Zoom, as I'm sure we all are. So give me just a minute. Um, so a couple of upcoming events that we have coming up. So tomorrow, we'll be doing our regs and eggs legislative um, wrap-up breakfast. So this basically gives um, members um, and non-members different options um, to um, see some of the different updates um, on topics including education, healthcare, labor, economic development, um, and tax issues, just to kind of name a few. So it's just gonna give us an opportunity to hear some dialogue between um, Senator Katie Fry Hester, uh, Delegate uh, Jessica Fieldmark, and Ashley Duckman with the um, Government Affairs for the Maryland Chamber. And we'll hear from Blaine Carey as well from Impact Marketing and Public Relations. Um, and then kind of switching sides of the spectrum, we're going to be launching screen to table as well. So we're going to be showcasing different chamber members, um, different restaurants over the next couple of weeks. So every other Thursday, we're going to be joining their chefs and they're going to be teaching us um, how to do some of their signature dishes. And um, we're hoping to be sharing the recipes as well on our site. So you can kind of join in and come along with us. And, um, Two more things, we have our COVID-19 briefing um, with um, President Chief Executive Officer Tom Barkin with the Federal Reserve Bank. So he's gonna be answering some questions um, on kind of what the uh, federal government is doing to address the crisis and what, um, what he sees kind of coming forward and that's gonna be on May 6th. And then again, so we have a lot of, a lot of days where we have two events going on. And then we're um, also launching cocktails, mocktails and carry out. So, we're kind of doing some networking with the twist, uh, basically bring any type of cocktail, mocktail, carry out if you want to even make it yourself. Um, just kind of another opportunity to kind of network and showcase some different businesses um, around the area. Okay, thank you so much and we hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.
Thanks. Yes, thank you all. Thank you all.